The cool wind whipped at the back of a young girl. Winter was arriving to the hills where her tribe made their home. Every year, as the temperature dropped, her band struggled to survive, mostly restricted to the warmth of a cave. They huddled around a fire, kept warm under blankets made of deer hide, and relied on nuts collected during warmer months to sustain themselves. The girl wore seashell jewelry, like her proud forebears. Her parents told stories of warmer years, years only known to long-lost ancestors, some of whom were buried in the ground of the cave under the girl's feet. She had no way of knowing that the climate on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean would only get colder for the next 10,000 years. It was not only the colder weather that was encroaching upon her tribe. As she looked out the cave entrance, she saw the faint glint of fires in the distance. She knew that those fires did not belong to people like her, but to the others, Neanderthals. These strange people were not as bothered by the cold as she was. The girl remembered a day from a month earlier, when out collecting pistachios and figs near the coast, her family had come upon some Neanderthals. A small Neanderthal child walked naked, while the girl's family all wore long tunics. She still remembered how strange their faces looked, and how funny they walked. Encounters like these were becoming more frequent. Her father often described how his hunting parties were chased off by groups of these northerners. Sadly, the girls' band had plans to head south next spring and leave behind their ancestral land. These hills were no longer as inviting as they had once been. This girl was one of the last homo sapiens to live in the wooded hills of the Levant before the Ice Age that began 70,000 years ago. Her people were the descendants of migrants from Africa, who had arrived thousands of years earlier. This tribe represents an early, but ultimately unsuccessful expansion of our species. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 7, Out of Africa, Part 1. For hundreds of thousands of years, Homo sapiens was largely confined to Africa. Appearing in this continent around 300,000 years ago, our species remained there throughout most of the Middle Stone Age, developing regional traditions of toolmaking and beginning to express more complex modes of thinking. At the same time, other hominin species inhabited Eurasia, including Homo neanderthalensis, Homo erectus, Homo floresiensis, and Denisovans. These evolutionary cousins of ours ranged from Europe to Southeast Asia. But this continental separation of human species was not destined to persist, and around 60,000 years ago, Groups of Homo sapiens moved out of Africa, and their descendants eventually replaced all other hominin species in Eurasia. There are many questions that surround this momentous event in our species' prehistory. When exactly did it happen? What allowed our species to succeed where the other human species didn't? Which routes did our ancestors take in these migrations? What technologies and traditions did they carry with them? Over the course of the next few episodes, we will use genetic, fossil, and archaeological information to explore the out-of-Africa migrations. To start, we need to get one key question out of the way, as it will inform today's episode. How many times did our species leave Africa? As you may have gathered from the opening scene, 
groups of Homo sapiens left Africa multiple times during the second half of the Middle Stone Age, but these excursions were not all permanent. We know this from a combination of fossil remains and DNA analysis. First, several fossils belonging to our species have been found in the Levant and Arabia that date from 200 to 80,000 years ago, suggesting migrations from northeastern Africa throughout the second half of the Middle Stone Age. However, genetic analysis shows that all non-Africans living today are descended from a single group of people that migrated from northeastern Africa around 60,000 years ago, near the end of the Middle Stone Age. This means that as we discuss the out of Africa migrations, we have to divide them into the early, temporary, and genetic dead end migrations, and the later, much more extensive and genetically successful exodus. In today's episode, we will focus on the early ventures of our species out of its home continent. How far did these early migrations reach? And why were they less successful than the journey at 60,000 years? To answer these questions, we will follow the remains left behind by our species and other hominins in Eurasia. This investigation will take us from Northeast Africa to the Levant, Arabia, Central Asia, and the Indian subcontinent. The journey from Africa to Eurasia was not the most inviting for foragers with simple Middle Stone Age technology. The passages between these continents consisted of narrow geographic gateways with harsh arid climates, probably only open to human migration during certain periods of prehistory, due to fluctuations in the climate. Archaeologists believe that two routes existed that our species could have used to leave Africa, both found in northeast Africa. The first potential route is through the Sinai Peninsula, the only terrestrial connection between these continents during the Middle Stone Age. It connects the delta of the Nile River to the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant. At its narrowest, this land bridge is only 130 kilometers from north to south and 200 east to west. The dryness of the Sinai would have been a major obstacle dissuading early Homo sapiens from making this crossing. Today, the Sinai is mostly desert, with sand dunes, little to no vegetation, and no permanent fresh water. Conditions are slightly less extreme along a narrow strip of Mediterranean coastland at the northern end of the Sinai, but even this part of the desert only receives 12 centimeters of rain per year. The second possible route out of northeast Africa is across the Bab al-Mandab Strait, more than 2,000 kilometers south of the Sinai. This narrow strip of water separates East Africa from the Arabian Peninsula and connects the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. Today, the Bab al-Mandab Strait is 20 kilometers wide, but when sea levels were lower, it was only 4 kilometers across, narrow enough to see land while standing on the other side. Low sea levels occurred several times during the Middle Stone Age, and simple rafts would have been sufficient to carry Middle Stone Age Homo sapiens across the strait. There's no direct evidence of seafaring by our species this early in prehistory, but based on stone tool evidence on the Arabian Peninsula, many experts believe that this crossing was made during the Middle Stone Age. Beyond the difficulty of the water crossing, this route would have been complicated by the extreme aridity of the land on either side of the strait. So how did hunter-gather bands of Homo sapiens exit Africa when confronted with these harsh environments? As you may have guessed, there were periods of prehistory when these areas were not as arid as today, meaning that humans did not have to cross large expanses of desert. During these opportune periods, foragers living near these two gateways out of Africa 
may have chosen to cross them. Last episode, we saw how large parts of the Sahara transformed into teeming grasslands for thousands of years at a time. In the deserts around the Bab al-Mandab Strait, a very similar phenomenon occurred. During wet phases, the coastal plain found around the African side of the strait was transformed from an arid scrubland to a much more forgiving grassland with running rivers. Some of the human groups living in the humid Ethiopian highlands probably moved down onto this coastal plain. If they made the voyage across the Red Sea, on the other side they would have found an Arabian savanna with lakes, rivers, and abundant wildlife instead of the desert that exists there today. Crucially, this means that the gateway of the Bab al-Mandab was only open to human migration when the climate in the region was wet and sea levels were low, limiting this route to very specific periods of the Middle Stone Age. In the case of the Sinai Peninsula, it's unclear exactly how much rain this key bottleneck location ever received, as it's too far north for tropical monsoon rain and too far south for rain coming from the North Atlantic. But we do know from geological records in the Levant, Northern Arabia, and the Nile Valley that the surrounding regions experienced periods of enhanced precipitation, which would have made the approach to the Sinai much easier for human groups living along the Nile. Throughout prehistory, the Nile River acted as a north-south corridor of movement from East Africa to the Mediterranean coast. At the north end, the wetlands of the Nile Delta probably supported groups of foragers, taking advantage of abundant aquatic plants and animals. During phases of increased precipitation, this delta population probably swelled. Some of these groups living on the easternmost channel of the delta may have looked to escape the growing population and moved across the Sinai. This would have included a 50 to 100 kilometer stretch of desert that remained even during the wettest climate of the Middle Stone Age. The most likely route is along the coast of the Mediterranean. This crossing must have been arduous with human bands relying on scarce seasonal springs or opportune moments of rainfall. But if they survived the crossing, woodlands and grasslands awaited them in the Levant, where fresh water was again abundant. Although difficult, we know that many animal species from Africa, including hippos, were able to exit Africa during wet phases. The Sinai is referred to as the Northern Route, and Bab al-Mandab the southern route. Archaeologists don't agree over which of these was the primary pathway out of Africa, and it's possible that both were used. Regardless, the routes out of Africa were narrow and treacherous, only accessible to a small number of hunter-gatherers in Africa, those living on the eastern portion of the Nile Delta or on the coastal plain northeast of the Ethiopian highlands. The difficulty and small size of these passages limited Homo sapiens to being an African species for the majority of our existence. Travelers put their lives at risk as they crossed the Sinai or the Bab al-Mandab, and it's worth asking why they chose this path. The people who migrated out of Africa had no conception of the historical significance of their actions. They did not know that they were leaving the continent of their own species to a new land inhabited by other hominins. Most likely, they made the decision to migrate based on a calculation of their own likelihood of survival. They sought food, water, and safety, just as human foragers had for millennia. It's possible that a worsening climate or a growing population pushed them to search for better land across these gateways. It's even possible that a technological innovation allowed these migrations by improving the chance of survival in these hazardous environments. Yet, we shouldn't discount the human desire for discovery. 
This drive, present in explorers of the historical period, likely fired the minds of early Homo sapiens, yearning to know what lay beyond the desert or the sea. Despite the challenges facing groups of foragers moving out of Africa, our species has a long history of making this voyage. The earliest clear evidence for the presence of Homo sapiens outside of Africa is the Mislia Cave in Israel, where in 2018 an upper jaw and cheekbone, along with several teeth, were identified as belonging to Homo sapiens, and dated to 185,000 years ago. This discovery places the first known out-of-Africa migration around the same time as the first known Homo sapiens with an anatomically modern rounded cranium, the Omo skull from East Africa. The presence of the Mislia fossils in the Levant is not surprising. This is a key region in the out-of-Africa story. This coastal belt between the eastern Mediterranean Sea and the northern Arabian Desert contains plains, mountainous terrain, Mediterranean woodland, and fresh water. It would have offered good habitat where forager populations could have become established and grown after surviving the migration across the Sinai. Significant archaeological research has been conducted in several caves along this stretch of land, providing some of the most solid evidence for out-of-Africa migrations. The age of the Mislia fossils suggests that Homo sapiens inhabited the cave just after a long warm interglacial period, which brought a wet climate to North Africa and the Levant. It seems likely that this increase in precipitation facilitated movement through the northern route, likely several thousands of years before the Mislia individual lived. The human bones were found alongside evidence of fire and various animal bones that were systematically transported back to the cave, including fallow deer, gazelle, and aurochs. The inhabitants of Mislia reused this cave many times based on the layers of material they left behind. The Mislians made tools from prepared cores, but used different techniques and produced different types of tools than those of later Homo sapiens populations in the Levant. The Mislian band made triangular tools from triangular cores in addition to blades. Their elongated points were extensively retouched along the margin to shape and sharpen them. It's also clear that these tools were hafted because the ends were polished from rubbing against a handle. The wear from the binding is also evident. As we start discussing the stone tools used by hominins in Eurasia, we need to take a brief tangent to introduce a new era of prehistory the Middle Paleolithic. This period is just the name that archaeologists have given to the Middle Stone Age of Eurasia. Not only does it encompass approximately the same time span, but the stone tools that define the Middle Stone Age are similar to those that define the Middle Paleolithic. Hominins in Eurasia used prepared core techniques to produce similar tools as those made by Homo sapiens in Africa, including scrapers, blades, and points. In Europe, Neanderthals were the primary manufacturers of these tools, whereas in Asia, it's less certain which species of hominin made them. There are enough similarities between the tools of Middle Stone Age Homo sapiens and those of other hominins that figuring out which species made a set of tools at an archaeological site in Eurasia is often difficult. Coming back to the Levant, triangular cores and tools like those of Mislia are found in several other caves nearby, suggesting that a local population of Homo sapiens lived in this region. But without more fossils, it's hard to know the duration and extent of this migration out of Africa. It's not even clear if this region was primarily inhabited by bands of Homo sapiens or Neanderthals 
during the warm, wet climate 200,000 years ago. One scenario that has some backing in genetic analysis is that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals came into contact during this interglacial. A recent study of ancient Neanderthal DNA reveals that small parts of their genetic code came from an interbreeding event with Homo sapiens more than 200,000 years ago. A likely location for this encounter would have been in the Levant, as groups of Homo sapiens, possibly the ancestors of those living at Mislia, moved north into territory occupied by Neanderthals. As we will see, this was not the last time sapiens and Neanderthalensis would cross paths. We don't know how long our species survived in the Levant after 185,000 years ago. The climate remained rather dry for tens of thousands of years, making journeys between Southwest Asia and Africa difficult. No fossils of Homo sapiens are found outside of Africa for another 60,000 years. It's likely that the Mislian population of our species died out. But with the arrival of the last interglacial 130,000 years ago, Northeast Africa and Southwest Asia got wetter, migration routes opened once again, and the Levant welcomed a new group of migrants from Africa. Evidence of this migration is found in the incredibly well-preserved fossils of several Homo sapiens discovered at the Israeli cave of Skul, near the Mediterranean coast. This group lived about 120,000 years ago. Similar fossils of our species were found at the nearby Kafsa cave, only 30 kilometers further inland. These bones are younger, only 90,000 years old. We've already talked about Skul and Kafsa in episode 2 as we traced the evolutionary history of our species. These individuals possessed a modern rounded cranium, but still displayed some archaic features, such as rather thick bones in the skull. Given the 30,000 year separation, it's unclear whether the people from Kafsa were direct descendants of those at Skull, or whether they originated from a separate migration from Africa. Regardless of their genetic relatedness, they shared several behaviors that distinguished them from contemporaries in Africa. First, at both sites, several individuals were intentionally buried, which is usually interpreted as a symbolic act, even a reflection of awakening spiritual beliefs. In fact, these burials are older than any known from the African Middle Stone Age. It's also believed that some people buried in these caves were interred along with grave goods. These include a boar's jaw found next to one skeleton at Skull, and an antler and engraved stone at Kafsa. At both sites, ochre had been collected, another hint of symbolic behavior in the form of painting. At Skull, the ochre had been placed in fire, which transformed its color from yellow to orange. Finally, at both sites, humans used seashells as beads, similar to those seen in North Africa around the same time. Interestingly, they selected the same sea snail shell, Nasarius, as chosen by people in the Maghreb. The extent of evidence for symbolic expression here in the Levant was rare in Africa at the time and it's tempting to speculate that migrant groups from Africa adopted more elaborate cultural traditions as they entered a new land and encountered other strange hominins. The role these customs played in their life is unknown, but social unit cohesion may have been one purpose. Beyond burials, ochre, and seashell beads, the people of school and casa also shared similar stone tool technology. In fact, this is the strongest direct cultural connection between these Levantines 
and Africa. At both Skoll and Kafsa, forger groups preferred to manufacture their tools using the centripetal Levallois technique. This method consists of preparing a core stone by removing flakes all the way around the edge to produce a circular or oval-shaped tool. Last episode, we saw that this technique was used by groups in Northeast Africa. While it was not the preferred technique of human groups in the Nile Valley, at seven Middle Stone Age archaeological sites in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Sudan, the majority of tools were made from centripetal Levallois cores. In fact, this technique goes back 200,000 years in the Ethiopian Rift Valley. In addition to Skul and Kafsa, several other caves in the Levant see an increased preference for these circular tools beginning about 130,000 years ago. It's possible that this specific method of making stone tools reflects a cultural tradition passed from generation to generation that was carried by forager groups as they migrated up the Nile Valley and across the Sinai Peninsula, or across the Bab al-Mandab Strait. Therefore, Some archaeologists believe that the centripetal Levallois marks the presence of Homo sapiens in Asia as they migrated out of Africa during the last interglacial. But this is where the interpretation of archaeological remains from the Middle Paleolithic gets tricky. First of all, Neanderthals had independently invented the centripetal Levallois in Europe, and there are several sites in France where this was the preferred tool-making technique, including tools from early on in the Middle Paleolithic. Second, Homo sapiens is not the only hominin known to occupy the Levant at this time. Around the same time that Homo sapiens was occupying Skull Cave, a different species of hominin lived only 80 kilometers to the south dated to 126,000 years ago, the Nesheramla cranium, jaw, and teeth belonged to either a Neanderthal with strange cranial features or some previously undocumented archaic hominin species. The experts don't agree on which species this specimen represents. But even more surprising is that the Nesher Ramla cranium was found along with a large collection of stone tools, 80% of which were made using the centripetal Levallois. This means that the presence of these round tools in the Levant can no longer be attributed definitively to Homo sapiens. Given the proximity of the Nesher Ramla hominin to Homo sapiens, both geographically and on the prehistoric timeline, the current hypothesis is that this Neanderthal-like population adopted this technology from the arriving Homo sapiens, a possible indication of cultural exchange between species. We can only wonder whether the Nesher Ramla hominin learned the centripetal Levallois by imitating discarded or traded tools or by direct instruction from a Homo sapiens. Despite the uncertainty in the provenance of the tools, the undisputed fossil evidence demonstrates repeated, if not extended, occupations by Homo sapiens in the Levant. But was this as far into Asia as they ventured? Surprisingly, there is no evidence that they were able to penetrate further to the north, Presumably, the Taurus mountains of modern-day Turkey, the colder climate, and possibly the presence of Neanderthals combined to prevent a further expansion northward. But north was not the only direction they could move. The Arabian Desert, much like the Sahara, has gone through cyclical changes throughout prehistory. During wet climatic phases, the entire southern half of this desert was converted into a green Arabian grassland. 
Within these grasslands, there were flowing rivers, abundant lakes, wetlands, and large mammals originating mostly from Africa. Increased rainfall in Arabia peaked during three periods of the last interglacial, once at 128,000 years ago, another 104,000 years ago, and a third 82,000 years ago. Green Arabia would have been more than adequate to sustain migrating foragers of humans from Africa. Each of these wet phases lasted 5 to 7,000 years and were interrupted by a return to desert. In fact, much like in the Sahara, the presence of stone tools demonstrates that hominins occupied the interior of the Arabian Peninsula repeatedly over the past 400,000 years. Unlike in the Sahara, it's not clear which hominin species made many of these Arabian tools. The older ones are Acheulean hand axes, usually associated with archaic hominins. But crucially, recent discoveries have shown that after 130,000 years ago, some of these tools belong to Homo sapiens. The earliest evidence of our species' presence in Arabia comes from an ancient lake bed in central Arabia, 650 kilometers southeast of Skul and Kafsa. Here, about 116,000 years ago, a group of hominins walked barefoot through mud along the edge of a lake. Within a few hours, this mud dried, and seven footprints of these hominins were preserved, alongside those of elephants and camels, and discovered by modern archaeologists. This paleo lake is called Alathar. The size and shape of these prints is more similar to that of Homo sapiens than any other hominin species. A second important discovery in Arabia came a few years ago, when a single hand bone was unearthed alongside Middle Stone Age tools at an archaeological site named al Wusta only a few kilometers from Alathar. It was dated to 85,000 years ago, similar to the skeletons of Kafsa, and the dimensions of this bone identify it as coming from a member of our species. It was found along with 350 stone tools, primarily made from centripetal Levallois cores, and bones of large African animals, including buffalo, hippos, and antelope, that would only have been found in Arabia during exceptionally wet climates. Alathar and al Wusta are the first solid evidence to support what many archaeologists had already hypothesized, that early migrations of Homo sapiens out of Africa were not restricted to the Levant. The footprints of Alathar in particular paint a vivid image of these early Arabian hunter-gatherers, sharing a valuable fresh water source with megafauna. Foragers in arid ecosystems such as these prehistoric Arabian grasslands tend to be very mobile, requiring large ranges to find enough food. They would have moved frequently from one lake or stream to another. In fact, stone tools from this period have been discovered that were transported more than 24 kilometers to a campsite at the edge of a lake. So we know that Homo sapiens ventured beyond the Levant. But how extensive was our species' colonization of the Arabian Peninsula, and which route did humans take to get there? Unfortunately, the shortage of fossil remains means that we must look to stone tools for answers. Unlike the Levant, where most tools at the time were made from rounded centripetal Levallois cores, the vast Arabian Peninsula fostered a much wider diversity of techniques. Intriguingly, two different styles of stone tools found in Arabia can be linked back to northeast Africa, the centripetal Levallois and the Nubian. Much like Homo sapiens in the Levant, some hominin groups in Arabia preferred the centripetal Levallois preparation of stone cores. This includes the Homo sapiens groups that made camp at al Wusta and the occupants of several other prehistoric sites scattered from northern Arabia to the southwest corner of the peninsula, near the Bab al-Mandab Strait. 
all of these tools are dated between 130 and 75,000 years ago. Most were found at the age of ancient lakes. The widespread and consistent use of this technique and its association with fossils of Homo sapiens in Northeast Africa, the Levant, and Arabia is strong evidence for the expansion of groups from Africa who carried with them this particular tradition of toolmaking. Some archaeologists favor the theory that these groups moved first from Africa to the Levant and then to Arabia. Sea levels were high starting 130,000 years ago, making the crossing of the Bab al-Mandab more difficult. At the same time, moving from the Levant to Arabia during the last interglacial required crossing a band of remaining desert, and a migration of foragers would have had to follow a series of oases, like stepping stones, over a span of more than 300 kilometers. But it appears that some groups did exactly this, because Middle Stone Age tools are found all along this very route. Even if only briefly, human populations in the Levant were connected to those in Arabia. But the archaeology of Arabia during the last interglacial is complicated by its diversity. Many groups of hominins did not use the centripetal Levallois technique at all. Instead, they relied heavily, in some cases exclusively, on the Nubian Levallois method of core preparation. As we learned in the last episode, the Nubian technique first appeared in the Nile Valley around 130,000 years ago and was a highly standardized technique that produced especially long points. One archaeological site at the southern edge of Arabia contains a high frequency of Nubian tools that are at least 107,000 years old. Many other undated sites in the region contain similar points and cores. At other sites in central Arabia, foraging hominin groups also used this method, but less frequently, suggesting a connection to human groups in the south. So what led to this distribution of Nubian tools? Some archaeologists hypothesize that this technique arrived in southern Arabia by way of migrants originating in the Nile Valley. Its predominance in the southern part of the peninsula is used to argue for a crossing of the Bab al-Mandab Strait. But again, this would have been difficult during the last interglacial. To complicate things even further, there are other locations around Arabia where hominins made stone tools during the last interglacial using other prepared core techniques that are difficult to categorize. For example, one site in eastern Arabia near the Persian Gulf has a rather unique and diverse collection of leaf-shaped points, blades, and scrapers dated to 125,000 years ago. The leaf-shaped points in particular are reminiscent of those from East Africa. If these tools were made by a group of Homo sapiens, what was their relationship to the crafters of centripetal and Nubian tools? We don't know, and are only beginning to uncover the prehistory of Arabia. However, we must also consider one possibility. The diversity of tools in Arabia may be the product of the coexistence of different hominin species in this region. We simply do not have enough fossils to identify the toolmakers, although archaeologists tend to favor the idea that most interglacial inhabitants of Arabia were Homo sapiens. What we can say for certain is that at least some of the hominins living in Arabia during the last interglacial were Homo sapiens, with strong connections in their material culture to Northeast Africa and the Levant, including the Nile Valley and the highlands of Ethiopia. The diversity of stone tools suggests that multiple migrations of Homo sapiens came from Africa into Arabia over the course of this period, which spanned tens of thousands of years. Different migrations from different origins bringing different tools. By 120,000 years ago, small foraging groups of Homo sapiens had expanded over a significant portion of southwestern Asia, 
probably from the eastern Mediterranean coast to the southern coast of Arabia. But did they push any further north or east? Did these early migrations out of Africa make it to Mesopotamia, the Iranian plateau, or even further? In answering this question, we suffer from a lack of fossil evidence and disagreements over the interpretation of archaeological remains. First, no Middle Stone Age tools have been found in Mesopotamia, due to the difficulty in finding sites buried deep below sediments along the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, where hominins would have been most likely to make camp. The ecosystems of the deltas of these rivers would have been especially abundant in resources for hunter-gatherers. Moving east from Mesopotamia, migrating groups of Homo sapiens would have encountered the Zagros mountain range, and beyond this, the arid Iranian plateau, both significant obstacles to movement. Yet, in both of these regions, many sites have been discovered with middle Paleolithic stone tools made from prepared cores. The similarity of these tools to those in Africa is less clear than those in the Levant and Arabia. Few sites have been dated and no fossils have been discovered that date to the last interglacial. So it's unclear whether it was Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, or some other species who made these tools in the Zagros Mountains and the Iranian Plateau. Within and beyond the Iranian Plateau, a series of deserts and arid grasslands challenged migration to the north and east. But some archaeologists believe that during the last interglacial, Homo sapiens successfully navigated these environments and arrived in the Indian subcontinent. This hypothesis is based solely on the types of stone tools found in this region, as no hominin fossils have been discovered here that are older than 40,000 years. The archaeology of the South Asian Paleolithic is rather well studied at many sites and shows a clear transition between different periods. Up until about 120,000 years ago, the Indian subcontinent was occupied by hominins who made large Acheulean hand axes. This is much later than those types of tools were used in Europe or Africa. After 120,000 years ago, hand axes were replaced by smaller prepared core tools of the Middle Paleolithic. Sites with prepared core tools became especially common in the region around 80,000 years ago. Along with this shift in tools came greater use of high-quality stones and the first documented use of ochre in the region. This transition probably represents the arrival of a new group of hominins, along with the warmer and wetter climate of the last interglacial. But who were these new people? The tools used by these groups included a diversity of methods for preparing the cores. At some sites, the Levallois method was common and used to produce points, blades, and scrapers. At others, simpler, less standardized methods were preferred. This technological diversity seen between 120 and 60,000 years ago in the Indian subcontinent allows for different interpretations of their origin. Some tools here have similarities to those used by Homo sapiens in Africa and Southwest Asia at the time, whereas others resemble those made by Neanderthals in Europe. Not to mention the possibility that the poorly understood Denisovans, who probably lived in Eastern Asia and were closely related to Neanderthals, could have also inhabited South Asia and made these tools. Despite these ambiguities, a couple specific characteristics of the Middle Paleolithic tools have been used to argue that they were made by Homo sapiens. First, at a handful of sites in central and southern India, the centripetal Levallois method was a common core reduction strategy about 80,000 years ago, much like at Al Wusta at the same time. Second, in the Thar Desert of Pakistan, Tools with stems were common at several sites around 100,000 years ago, bringing comparisons to the Atyrian tanged tools of northern Africa. In addition, a large proportion of these tanged tools were points, reminiscent of the African Middle Stone Age. 
However, the absence of tanged tools in Southwest Asia seems to suggest that tanged points in the Thar Desert were an independent invention from those in Africa. While the sophistication of these tools is impressive for this period of prehistory, it's not enough to definitively prove the presence of Homo sapiens in South Asia at the time. At this point, I would like to briefly mention that there have been fossils discovered in several caves of East and Southeast Asia, including China, that belong to Homo sapiens and were found in sediments dated between 120 and 80,000 years old. These fossils originally seem to show that the early interglacial migration out of Africa reached all the way to East Asia. While this scenario is not impossible to imagine, it has recently been revealed that the current evidence has serious issues. A study of fossils from three of these East Asian sites using direct radiocarbon dating and extraction of ancient DNA has shown that they are at most 40,000 years old, and some as young as 5,000 years. Currently, the most likely scenario is that East Asia remained free of our species until later expansions out of Africa. While the maximum extent of the interglacial expansion out of Africa is difficult to pinpoint, the ultimate destiny of the first Eurasian members of our species is understood. Genetic evidence suggests that none or very few of the Homo sapiens from this migration are related to people living today anywhere in the world. In other words, these early populations of Homo sapiens in Eurasia eventually died out or became so small to be genetically invisible. And we have a good idea of what caused this decline. Around 70,000 years ago, the Earth entered a period of global cooling and aridification. Temperatures dropped several degrees and Southwest Asia became much colder than it is today. The African fauna that had thrived in the green Arabian grasslands disappeared. Large areas of land once full of plants to be foraged turned to desert. With the cooling climate, Neanderthals expanded their range southward from the Taurus Mountains, encroaching on Homo sapien groups living in Asia. Between about 80 and 55,000 years ago, Neanderthals inhabited the Levant, the Caucasus region, and the Zagros Mountains to the east. Their bones have been discovered in at least six caves in these regions. In fact, they even moved into some of the caves that had been previously occupied by Homo sapiens. The remains left behind by Neanderthals of this southern dispersal highlights their social capacity and intelligence. In the Zagros Mountains, Shanidar Cave was a site where Neanderthals intentionally buried their dead in graves lined with plants. Several individuals from Shanidar survived serious injury and sickness. Neanderthals maintained caring social relationships within their bands and nursed each other back to health. Furthermore, stone tools made by Neanderthals were just as sophisticated as those used by Homo sapiens. They did not use the centripetal method very often and instead preferred the unidirectional variation of the Levallois. When preparing the core with this technique, the toolmaker strikes the core repeatedly from the same direction to remove flakes. The shift from centripetal to unidirectional Levallois in the Levant is used by archaeologists to identify the replacement of Homo sapiens by Neanderthals. Interestingly, some Neanderthals may have adopted a type of stone tool from Homo sapiens they encountered as they moved southward. A recent archaeological dig in a Levantine cave uncovered Nubian points alongside a Neanderthal tooth, dated to this period of southern dispersal. These are the only Nubian tools ever discovered to be associated with Neanderthals. The disappearance of Homo sapiens fossils and tools from southwestern Asia tells the story of how our species was replaced. Under the harsher climate and competition from another hominin species, 
Homo sapiens retreated southward. Neanderthals, with their stocky build, were more well adapted to a cold climate. Our species probably suffered high death rates and severe reductions in population size. This decline was so severe that when the next migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa occurred, there was very little, if any, mixing with refuge populations left behind in Eurasia. On the other hand, in the Indian subcontinent, the archaeological evidence suggests that its hominin occupants did not suffer drastic alterations to the population with this global cooling. Even the massive eruption of the Indonesian volcano Toba 74,000 years ago, which left 4 centimeters of ash in central India, had little impact on the fate of hominin groups there, based on the continuity of material culture after this eruption. Whether they were Denisovans, Homo sapiens, or Neanderthals, they would continue their way of life for tens of thousands of years to come. So why was this initial expansion out of Africa only temporary? And why did it not reach beyond Southwest Asia? If there was a climatic period that would have favored the expansion of our species the most, it seems like it would have been the extremely warm and wet climate starting around 130,000 years ago. Migration routes opened that were once blocked by deserts or glacier-covered mountain ranges. Networks of flowing rivers once dry provided convenient pathways across once impenetrable arid plains. This period was much more favorable in environmental terms than 60,000 years ago, when a much more permanent expansion out of Africa took place. The answer to this question is probably a combination of factors. First, our species might have lacked technological innovations that allowed later migrant groups to better confront cold weather in more northern latitudes. For example, warm, well-fitting clothing, unnecessary in most of Africa, may have been key in Eurasia. Second, populations of other hominin species may have posed more of an obstacle to Homo sapiens during the more favorable climate of the interglacial. It does seem that Neanderthals expanded their range eastward into Asia at this time, with one Neanderthal fossil even discovered in Siberia. And finally, some archaeologists argue that a specific cognitive evolution did not occur in our species until 60,000 years ago that was necessary to confront the challenges encountered in Eurasia. Whatever the obstacle, the outcome was that a tide of Neanderthals washed away an early attempt of our species to leave Africa. In our next episode, Homo sapiens will begin the much more permanent, world-changing dispersal across Eurasia and Oceania. This has been Our Prehistory. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider visiting this podcast Patreon page and becoming a contributor so that I can continue bringing you Our Prehistory.